Hi everyone, welcome back to Workshop and it's repair time again. And this time I've got a Ray Caldena 9900 Universal Counter Timer. I picked this one up on eBay. It was actually on my watch list for quite a while before I actually bit the bullet and uh, purchased it. And like I said, it is faulty, but it has a little bit of an unusual fault. Let me put power into it right now and we'll see what the unit does. PCBWay is your one-stop solution that's been expanded from their large variety of PCB prototyping solutions to 3D printing, CNC machine work and sheet metal fabrication. PCBWay also has a growing community on their site where it's become an open platform for makers to exchange and share their ideas, including the PCBWay store where some of the hottest modules can be purchased. I've been using PCBWay for years for my own products. Always reliable, always quality and always on time. Now when I say it's got an unusual fault, the problem with the unit was actually described on the eBay ad itself. But well, let me just put power on and you will see I've got an overflow LED so we're obviously getting power but I've got absolutely nothing on the display. There's absolutely nothing. So let's open it up and I'll show you what the fault is. And there we go. And that's the underside there quite old school and yes it's not a CAD produced circuit board it's definitely been laid by hand you can see all these curved traces like that yep that's been hand laid out and there's the top side there so let me reposition the camera let me zoom in on where the fault is okay so here we are inside the unit quick look around first one big board in the bottom of the unit there quite old school, no microprocessor in sight, but over here we've got a transformer and we've got a nice plastic cover over the primary and secondary connections there. We've got a large electrolytic over here, IEC filter connector down at the bottom there, a fuse, we've got a transistor mounted here and the bridge rectifier for the power supply is actually mounted on the rear of the unit here. Next to that, we've got a BNC connector on, uh, that's a one megahertz output on the rear of the unit. And over here, we've got the main oscillator board. And there's actually a hole in the back of the unit with a pot that you can uh, trim it, you can adjust it. And the wires for that just come down onto the main board. And over at the other end, we've got a display board. You can see all the switches there that go to the front panel. And we've got this large ribbon here that comes down onto the main board. Now, like I said, it's old school. There's no microprocessor as such. And what this design is based around is this chip here, a Ferranti 224601. That's an LSI chip. Everything to do with the functionality of this counter timer is basically driven from this 224601. And actually, this is where we've got the problem. It was described in the eBay ad as having a problem with one of the pins on the main oscillator chip and I think they meant the LSI chip and this chip's commonly known as the CDI chip but it is actually just an LSI. Let me zoom in and let's take a closer look. Now if you look closely you can see the pins of this 24 pin package here and this pin here is missing and the one next to it looks a little bit bent. So with a pin missing to this package, it's no surprise that I'm getting absolutely nothing on the front panel when I powered it up there. Now the other curious thing is, it's not readily identifiable which is pin 1 on this package. Now you could think that maybe this red dot signifies pin 1, but looking online, I've seen photographs of a 224601, and this red dot tends to move around in this area. It's not like as close to the corner as this one is. So I'm not really that sure. And when you look at the main text on the chip, it's normally readable from the pin one being at your left hand end. So this would look to be pin one over here. Now looking at the schematic for this unit, 
Well, actually, I don't have the schematic for this exact unit, but I've got a schematic for a similar unit that actually shows the 224601 on it. And I was able to identify that. I'll bring it up on screen here. I was able to identify that as having the standard 24 pin package in terms of the power supply, i.e. pin 12 would be ground, pin 24 would be supply. And if I just go onto ground here, there's a convenient uh, copper pour here. I'll just go down onto that. And if I just go here. You can see this is a grounded pin here. And also in the schematic, pin 23 is grounded as well. So if I go up here, assuming this is 24 up there. Yep. This is how I opened it up. But one other curious thing that the seller noted in the EB ad, they were able to confirm that this chip was actually faulty with the broken pin, obviously, because they switched out a good 224601 in its place and the unit apparently powered up perfectly. And I'm assuming they put the chip in as they found it i.e. we'll assume that pin 1 is indeed at this bottom corner. So what am I going to do about it? Well I could buy a replacement chip, they are available on eBay, however they're priced at about 30 UK pounds, which is about the same as what I bought the entire unit for, so I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to try and repair this chip. Now the pin is actually cut off right flush with the body of this package. Now it seems to be a ceramic package, it's definitely not plastic. So what I'm going to attempt to do is actually file away the corner of this chip and see if I can expose some of the metal of that broken pin so that I can solder on or attach somehow a new leg. So first things first, let's get it removed from the socket and onto the workbench. It's not in tight so I seem to be getting away with just lifting up, but the socket seems to be coming with it, and unless it's some kind of weird socket where we've got pins on the PCB, I'm not entirely sure. But it's coming up rather easily. There we go. <laughs> and yes, look at that. The socket came away with it, and I'm left with some pins down on the main board there. So I'll have to extract that socket from the IC and put it back onto the board. And underneath the socket we've got a black mark over here. That would seem to indicate that this is indeed pin 1 as I confirmed. So there is the chip. A nice custom Ferranti part. And you can see there that's that pin 13 just chopped off right flush with the body. The rest of the pins look okay. Maybe one or two of them are a little bit bent, but I'm not going to attempt to try and straighten them. And there's the underside. So what I'm actually going to do is, because it's a ceramic package, I think I'll get away with actually just using my needle file sets and just filing away at this corner here and try and expose the underlying metal of that pin. Now normally the die for these chips is quite small in the middle there and you've got metal runs from that central position there out to each of the pins themselves. They actually fan out. So being this corner one, there's actually going to be quite a long run right along to there. So hopefully we should be able to expose some of that in order that I can solder on a new pin. So let me get the needle file set out and let's give it a bash. I've got a bunch of files to choose from, but I think I'm actually going to use this square file here. It's got quite a narrow end to it, nice and square, so it has some flat edges. I should be able to file down the corner of that package. So let me give that a bash now. And I've put the package into a turn pin socket. Uh, partly just to protect the pins as I file it, because they are pretty weak. And also I'm going to leave it in the socket, because... I'm going to use this pin 13 socket here and I can put some solder on there and I'll be able to jump her across hopefully onto the top of that uh, broken pin if I can expose it. So let's get the square file going and let's start filing it down.
Well, Square File's not getting anywhere. Not surprising because it's a ceramic package. So I'm going to change it out from a glass file. And I do actually have a square glass file as well. That should cut into this ceramic package a lot easier. Well, there we go. The glass needle file worked absolutely perfectly. And I filed it down quite flat actually because I didn't want to go at an angle. Obviously, I wasn't going to do me much good. I wanted to expose some of the top surface there. So I had actually. I did actually have to file it quite flat and I managed to expose a little bit of the corner there. I think that might be enough to put a solder uh, connection down onto that socket there. But I'll take another little look, file it down a little bit more and let's see how much more I can expose. Well, by the looks of it, the actual pin takes a dip downwards now. I've only been able to expose a little bit of the top surface before it looks like it dips down a bit or goes down at an angle, I'm not sure. But I think I've got enough there to solder onto. So let me go away and I'll need to put my head right over this to get, some, uh, get an eyeball on it and uh, I'll come back when I've soldered it on. So there we go, there's the wire attached. Now if you notice, I haven't just gone straight down. I've actually put a loop on it. And the reason for that is, when I press this IC back into the board, there's a chance this IC could actually move in this socket. And therefore there's a chance I could rip the wire off of the ceramic package there again. So I don't really want to do that. But all the other pins, as you can see, are all nicely in this turn pin socket. So I think we're ready to put this back into the board and let's see if it actually works. And today I'm actually going to exercise my manual desoldering skills. It's good to keep on top of those. Not going to use the electronic one to desolder this socket. Well, that's a weird and wonderful IC socket, that. The component parts that make it up. Wow. Well, before I actually refit the IC, still got that niggling doubt that that's not pin one at this corner here. I did look online and I found some photographs of a different unit and somebody would actually put a black mark in the corner, but this corner where the text is readable. Now I'm going to go back old school here. Basically, you orientate the chip so that you can read the text and bottom left hand corner is pin one. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and try that. Okay. With the chip turned around 180 degrees, let's try a power up. Still nothing on the display. Yes! <laughs> it's working! Yes, and we've got a readout there. I don't know if you can see that on the camera there. Yes. And yes, we've definitely got some digits on the display. Wow. So, the previous owner, when they said they were checking out that chip by replacing it with another one, whether they actually did that or not, not too sure, but looks like when they reinserted this faulty chip or this broken chip, they put it 180 degrees round the wrong way. And of course, I did power it up when I got it and it survived. Wow. Or it appears to have survived anyway. So let me go ahead and hook up my function generator and let's see if we're actually getting some functionality on this front panel. And of course it wasn't pin 13 that was broken, it was pin 1, which is one of the other pins on the package. 
and it's working. I'm actually feeding a 12.3456 kilohertz square wave into the unit and as you can see I'm getting that on the display no problem at all. I'm using the A input I've got it set to frequency using the auto mode and as you can see 12.345 and if I put it into manual mode, I should be able to use the range selection switches. Yep, 12.34. Let's go to the left. 12.345. Will it work over this end here? Nope, too much for that range. Yep. Looks like that's working great as well. But what about the B input? Well, I've got it set up the same 12.3456 kilohertz square wave, 50% duty cycle. So that is just over 81 microseconds period. And as you can see, I'm getting 81 on the display there, jumping around a tiny little bit. But that's going to be the stability and accuracy of this unit here, the main oscillator in the back there. It's just a simple one. And it looks like that's working as well. Now I've got the start stop set from rising edge to rising edge. Now of course I can go rising edge to fallen edge. And that'll effectively half the display because I'm only looking at half of that square wave there. So it looks like it's working. And whilst it's running here, just take another quick look at that IC there. And there it is. Just for confirmation, I did actually reverse it round, turn it round 180 degrees and it did actually survive the initial power up. Wow. Now this chip does actually have a two volt supply according to schematic. I have measured it and it's sitting at 2.5. I presume that's okay. I don't see too much to go wrong with the power supply. There is actually only one electrolytic capacitor there. Well no actually there's one down there as well but they're quite big. I'm not going to change them out. They don't look like they've been leaking whatsoever. So everything looks okay in there. I kind of know my way around these units because back in the day I did actually use its bigger brother. I think was it the 9905 or something like that. It was basically identical to this except it had a couple of extra functions on it. And uh, I actually used to use it to manually adjust a PWM output on a speed sensor uh, used uh, offshore for measuring the speed of the actual rotary table on the drill floor. But yes, I did like these units because uh, they were dead easy to use. We did actually have um, a couple of Ray Caldena 1991s also, but they were actually a bit harder to set up. Now, the, the problem being with a lot of youngsters or trainee technicians in the workshop, and it was just far easier for to set them up with this counter timer. You can't really go wrong. There's only this has to be set this is to be set and a couple of switches there with the 1991 it was a bit more involved and the final thing I'm going to do before I box it back up I'm actually going to put some UV glue over this corner here just to protect that uh, Kynar wire that I've put on there uh, in case it gets knocked off or anything like that there we go there's a glue in place just got my UV torch on it just to make it set and hopefully that will hold it and uh, allow that chip to be in there for many years to come. Well, there we go. It's all back together again. And I've got 123.456 a microsecond period coming in and it's working perfectly. I'm going to keep this unit for a while, I think. Put it up on the workbench because I really like these old units from my past. And it'll be good to see it uh, getting used every now and then. So thanks for watching and remember you can comment below and don't forget to like and subscribe. It really does help the channel grow. And if you want to help more directly then you can always donate via PayPal or Patreon in the links below. There's plenty more repair videos on my channel. Check them out and thanks for watching.